Real stories from history can seem mundane and rather boring at times. But there are some real stories in the true history of the world that remain unexplained mysteries due to their creepy and often inexplicable nature. Some of these scariest and creepiest moments have baffled experts for decades, and in some cases for centuries, and they are seemingly destined to remain that way. Scary true war stories from World War II are a dime a dozen, since it was a tragic and brutal war that lasted for six years. But not everyone is familiar with the apocryphal story of the German gold trade that is still debated by historians today. During the dying embers of World War II, an armored train belonging to German forces was headed for Waldenburg. The train was filled with the spoils of war. 330 tons of gold, jewelry, artworks, and weapons that had been collected throughout the conflict. And the first leg of its journey went perfectly to plan, with the train arriving as scheduled. However, on the next stretch of the trip, the train is suspected to have traveled into a tunnel system, located where a top secret government construction project was still underway. The tunnels, which were built by German forces, are estimated to be around 7.5 million cubic feet long, and at present, only 3.5 million cubic feet have been explored, with the rest remaining undiscovered due to its confusing construction and failing support systems. After entering the tunnels, the train was never seen again, and there is an ongoing debate as to whether it ever really existed. Some people believe that the train's final destination was, in fact, kept a secret, and that it wasn't headed for Waldenburg at all. Others believe that the train is still hidden in the tunnel system, and that its treasures can still be retrieved. In August of 2015, news outlets reported that two men, Peter Koper from Poland and Andreas Richter from Germany, obtained a deathbed confession from a man claiming that the train was indeed still buried in the tunnels. They then negotiated with the Polish government to receive 10% of the treasure's value if they were able to locate it. In September, the two men announced that they'd found a 160-foot shaft with the use of ground-penetrating radar, and that they believed the train to be inside it. In August of 2016, excavation at the site started and it was later found that what they presumed to be the train was actually a set of natural ice formations. And despite ongoing efforts to find the buried treasure, no one has been able to, and its existence remains shrouded in mystery. Ambrose Bierce was an American Civil War veteran, poet, and short story author whose book The Devil's Dictionary was named by the American Revolution Bicentennial Administration as one of the 100 greatest masterpieces in American literature. He is also known for the story An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, which has been anthologized on many occasions and is also considered to be one of the most famous American stories ever written. He was also considered one of the most influential journalists in the country at the time and his horror stories have been ranked alongside greats such as Edgar Allan Poe and H.P. Lovecraft. In October of 1913, Bierce informed reporters that he would be traveling to Mexico in order to gain first-hand experience of the Mexican Revolution that was ongoing at the time, and to revisit some of the battlefields where he had fought during the Civil War. Now aged 71, he traveled through Louisiana and Texas before crossing into Mexico via El Paso. He joined Pancho Villa's army as an observer of the Battle of Tierra Bianca and remained with Villa's army until they reached Chihuahua. His last known communication is a letter that he wrote to a friend, which ended with the words, As to me, I leave here tomorrow for an unknown destination. He was never again seen and his disappearance would become one of the most puzzling and well-known in the history of American literature. Some people believe that the letter didn't really exist and that Bierce intentionally kept his whereabouts a secret so that he could end his own life in the Grand Canyon. 
Upon intensive investigation, it was found that he was last seen in Chihuahua in January, and despite a lot of conjecture and theories being put forward, he was never located and his true fate remains an unexplained mystery that will seemingly never be solved. Earl Hancock Ellis started his career in the U.S. Marine Corps in 1900 when he enlisted as a private in Chicago. Five months later, he was promoted to corporal and after passing a competitive examination 10 months after that, he was promoted to second lieutenant. In 1914, he was selected as a member of a joint Army-Navy board committee that was tasked with studying the defensive capability of Guam and here, he served as a chief of police, registrar of the civil government, and intelligence officer. But during his time in Guam, his health started to deteriorate, and it would later be found that it was due to his excessive drinking. In August of 1915, he returned to Washington, and the following year he was promoted to major. By this time, Ellis had built up a reputation for being an excellent strategist and planner leading to a recommendation that he would be promoted to colonel. He was not promoted at the time, but received the Navy Distinguished Service Medal and the Navy Cross. He would also later receive the Civil Star Medal for heroism. On the 1st of January, 1920, Ellis was admitted to the hospital and diagnosed with delirium tremens, depression, and neurasthenia, which is a mechanical weakness of the nerves all attributed to his further abuse of alcohol. Following his discharge from the hospital, he aided in the forming of the National Guard in Santo Domingo, and his performance there was once again praised. At the end of 1920, he produced a document, now considered prophetic, called Operation Plan 712, Advanced Base Operations in Micronesia. In it, he suggested that if hostilities were to break out with Japan, the U.S. would need advanced bases to support its fleets. He further predicted that Japan would start a war, but that they would remain near their own waters until the U.S. fleet approached. He also claimed that heavy losses would be suffered in an area he called the Shipshore Belt due to confusion during amphibious attacks. He suggested that war planners minimize this by properly organizing task forces before they were deployed and that units should stay together rather than being divided up during transport. In April of 1921, he was granted permission to conduct an undercover reconnaissance mission to the Marshall and Carolyn Islands, where he would travel as a supposed civilian. His request was approved, and he traveled to Yokohama, Japan, where he obtained a visa to travel to the islands. He suffered more bouts of illness during his reconnaissance mission, but kept drinking heavily, and in 1923, when his friends attempted to keep him sober, he unsuccessfully raided one of their houses in search of alcohol. The Japanese police had become aware of his condition and sent him two bottles of whiskey, both of which he then finished before passing away the same day. Many people believed that it was due to a clever assassination ruse by the Japanese police who poisoned his alcohol in an attempt to end his prolific and prophetic career once and for all. In August of 1943, conflict had broken out between American and Japanese forces on an island in the South Pacific. When the firefight was over and dust had settled, Marine Corporal Robert Goddard came upon a deceased Japanese soldier and decided to search him for any souvenirs he could find. In one of his pockets, he found a newspaper clipping containing a photo of an American woman who was entered to compete in a beauty pageant. This surprised him as the article noted that the woman would be representing St. Petersburg, which was his hometown. He kept the clipping and two years later in 1945, he arrived at the home of Wanda Wilson, a model who worked for Florida Power. He knocked on her door and told her that he had something he wanted to give her. He produced the clipping and told her that he had found it 8,800 miles away and that he believed it was her in the photo. To her shock and amazement, he was right 
and she revealed that the article was from the St. Petersburg Times, March 1942 edition. The article had been published nearly 18 months before Goddard found it on the Japanese soldier, and they were left with one baffling question. How had Wanda's photo ended up in the soldier's pocket? It was assumed that an American soldier had kept the clipping and it had been pilfered off of him after passing away, only to be found by Goddard. But when Wilson was shown a list of names of American paratroopers and men who served in Goddard's outfit, she didn't recognize any of them and she was unable to give any explanation as to how her photo ended up in the man's pocket. And to this day, it remains a truly weird historical mystery. Weird history doesn't get much stranger than the tale of the Pearl Harbor ghost plane. On the 6th of December 1942, more than a year after the attack on Pearl Harbor, United States radar picked up a plane heading for America from the direction of Japan. They found this especially strange as it was only a single plane and hence was unlikely to be part of an attack. Two American pilots were sent out in their planes to intercept the aircraft and to investigate. As they drew closer to the plane, they realized that it was a P-40 and that it bore markings that the military hadn't used since the Pearl Harbor attack. But things got even stranger. As they pulled level with the plane, they saw that it had been in a firefight and was riddled with holes. It also didn't have any landing gear leaving them baffled as to how it could have taken off, let alone fly in the condition that it was in. They then realized that the pilot was slumped over in the cockpit, and they were unsure whether or not he was still alive. But in the next moment, the pilot lifted his head, smiled at them, and raised his hand in a weak wave. Seconds later, the plane went into a dive and crashed into the ground below. The two pilots immediately reported the incident and troops were sent out to the crash site to investigate. But when they arrived, they found the plane, but no pilot. They were also unable to find any identifying markings on the plane, but a document was retrieved that seemed to be the remains of a diary. After it was studied, it was found that the plane likely originated from the island of Mindanao, thousands of miles away. Some people believe that the plane was downed during the attack on Pearl Harbor and that the pilot managed to survive in the wild and rebuilt it using scavenged parts, making his way back from Hawaii before being picked up on radar and crashing. However, what remains a creepy part of history is the whereabouts of the pilot who has never been found. The Zodiac is a man who needs no introduction. If you're into true crime, then there is a 100% chance you've heard of the Zodiac and his crimes. Between 1968 and 1969, this unidentified man terrorized California with a string of crimes that left residents fearful to even leave their homes. This terror was only amplified when the unknown man, who called himself the Zodiac, began sending cryptic letters to newspapers throughout Northern California. These letters were coded and took investigators years to decipher. While each letter had slightly different contents, they were all signed off with the zodiac symbol, a cross through a circle. The process of unmasking the zodiac has spanned for decades, capturing the attention of crime sleuths both old and new. The case captured the public's attention and is still talked about all over the world. Many people believe that the infamous Zodiac may never be caught, but in 2021, a shocking announcement was made. In early October 2021, a group calling themselves the Case Breakers, who are 40 former law enforcement investigators, announced to the world that they believed they had finally identified the infamous Zodiac. This announcement sent the world into a frenzy with media outlets scrambling to be the first to break the story and to get an interview with the group who had cracked one of the biggest historical mysteries of all time. The group used forensic evidence and new eyewitness testimonies to re-examine the case and hopefully bring it to a close. 
in their announcement, they named Gary Post as the Zodiac and claimed that William's photos found in his darkroom linked him to the case. According to a Fox News article written on October 6th, they state, One image features scars on the forehead of Post that match scars on a sketch of the Zodiac. Other clues, including deciphering letters sent by the Zodiac that reveal him as the killer. In one note, the letters of Post's full name were removed to reveal an alternate message. This announcement was met with heavy criticism, especially from both the Valaho Police Department and the San Francisco Police Department and the FBI who said that they would examine the evidence for themselves. The San Francisco Police Department told CNN, quote, It's still an open investigation. We're unable to speak to potential suspects as this is still an open investigation. The FBI commented on this announcement saying, quote, The Zodiac case remains open. We have no new information to share at the moment. The case breakers were also met with heavy criticism from the true crime community who asked the group to provide concrete evidence that Gary Post is in fact the Zodiac. So far, no evidence apart from photographs has been provided. And while this is a major update in the Zodiac case, it may be false hope. 19-year-old Samantha Jean Hopper jumped into her blue Ford Tempo on the morning of September 11, 1998 and left her home in Russellville, Arkansas. Reports indicate that at the time, Samantha was driving to a concert and that she was also nine months pregnant. Somewhere along her journey, something happened to Samantha, and as the evening rolled around, she was nowhere to be found. Her family noted this as odd as she was a devoted mother to her children and always let someone know where she was going and if she was going to be late. By that evening, Samantha's family filed a missing person report and the investigation began. Sadly, despite the best efforts of investigators, no trace of Samantha was found and her family desperately waited for answers. Friends and family conducted their own searches and asked the public for their assistance in locating their loved one. Years passed and Samantha's family never forgot about her. Her daughter, Desiree, who was two at the time of her mother's disappearance, kept her mother's memory alive in whatever way she could. In late October 2021, the nonprofit group Adventures with Purpose and Chaos Divers who aim to solve cold cases searched the Illinois Bayou near the 3700 block of Pleasant View Road in Arkansas. Submerged in the 8-foot deep body of water was a blue Ford Tempo that matched the description of Samantha's car. The car was recovered from the water and inside, the searchers found human remains. Following this discovery, the nonprofit organization called the Pope County Sheriff's Office to inform them of their discovery and the human remains were sent to the Arkansas State Crime Lab for DNA testing. These DNA results are still pending. However, the Pope County Sheriff's Office firmly believes that they belong to 19-year-old Samantha Jean Hopper. Samantha's case is still being investigated by law enforcement, and her family says that they're grateful for Adventures with Purpose and the Pope County Sheriff's Office for their investigation. 19-year-old Kristen Smart was over the moon when she enrolled at the California Polytechnic State University in 1996. The hardworking student had graduated from Lincoln High School in nearby Stockton, California and was looking forward to the bright future ahead of her. Sadly, one May evening in 1996 would change all that when she disappeared without a trace, making her case one of the strangest cases in history. On the evening of May 25, 1996, Kristen attended a party at a frat house that was off campus. Her friends didn't feel like attending that party, so they agreed to drop her off at the house and told her that they would see her later. This was the last time that Kristen's friends ever saw her alive, and it would be 25 years until they would find out the truth of what had happened to their lively friend. At around 2 a.m., Kristen was found passed out in the front garden of a neighbor's house by two other California Polytechnic students, Cheryl Anderson and Tim Davis. 
The two roused Kristen and helped her onto her feet and asked where she lived. When they found that she lived in a nearby dormitory, they agreed to walk her back to ensure that she got home safely. That's when Paul Flores entered the picture. Flores was also a student at California Polytechnic, and he went above and beyond, promising Cheryl and Tim that he would personally take Kristen to her room. Little did Cheryl and Tim know that Flores had sinister intentions. By Flores' account, he walked as far as his dormitory with Kristen, Santa Lucia Hall, before leaving Kristen to walk to another hall the rest of the way. We now know that his statement was a lie, a lie that wouldn't be uncovered for another 25 years. When Kristen failed to show up for classes in the days after May 25th, her classmates and professors became worried about her. The university contacted her family to see if perhaps she had gone home, but they hadn't seen or heard from her. It took a week for the local police department to take Kristen's disappearance seriously. As we all know, the first 24 hours of a missing person case are the most important. And as time passes, the chance of finding the person becomes slimmer and slimmer. After a slow start, the investigation quickly gained traction, but failed to show up any clues as to where Kristen could be. Months turned to years and the case slowly turned cold. Kristen's family were desperate for answers and did everything they could to find their loved one. Numerous trash sites were searched and in 2002, Kristen was declared deceased in absence, even though her body had never been found. While the progress in Kristen's case dwindled, interest didn't. Kristen's case became the subject of documentaries, YouTube videos, and podcasts, all hoping to bring light to her case. Then in September of 2021, the world was shocked to hear that Paul Flores, the man who was last seen with Kristen walking her to her dorm, had been formally charged and arrested in the case. 80-year-old Ruben Flores, Paul's father, had also been charged as an accessory to the crime, with the prosecution alleging that Ruben hid Kristen's body and moved it several years later. The father-son duo stood before a court in October of 2021 and entered their pleas of not guilty and set in motion a full criminal proceeding. Those involved in the case expect that the trial will take place in April of 2022, although this may be pushed back due to legal complications. Kristen's family addressed the media via a statement saying, quote, We are comforted in the knowledge that Kristen has been held in the hearts of so many and that she has not been forgotten. The Nazca Lines, located on the Peruvian coastal plain, have been a source of curiosity for over 100 years. There are over 800 lines, with some of the lines being 30 miles long. The lines meet and group together to create stunning drawings of animals, plants, and geometric designs. The true beauty of the Nazca Lines is observed from the air, where it becomes clear how all of these lines work together to form shapes. These lines were created by the Nazca people who lived from 200 BCE to 600 BCE. Although some shapes predate the Nazca and belong to other ancient societies, the most infamous Nazca line is the hummingbird, which is over 50 meters tall. When these lines were discovered in the 1920s, historians were left wondering what these drawings meant and how the Nazca people had drawn them with such precision. Experts spent decades studying the mystifying lines and attempting to interpret their meanings. Then in late 2019, researchers from Japan went to the Nazca lines and began their own investigation. Their report in the Journal of Archaeological Science detailed how the Nazca lines had been incorrectly identified for over 100 years. In their report, they detailed how many lines had been overlooked and labeled incorrectly, when they were actually made to represent exotic birds. An excerpt from the journal article reads, quote, The amount of rainfall in the highlands was estimated by observing the migration of seabirds when seabirds migrate to mountainous regions of the Nazca area during November and December, it's expected that rain will fall in the highlands. 
On the other hand, if migrating seabirds are not observed, water shortages are feared. This new team of researchers believed that the lines were made to honor the birds and were set up as an area of worship for them, possibly believing that if they kept the birds and gods happy, they would be blessed with rainfall. The Nazcas, like any society at the time, depended heavily upon rainfall, and this is perhaps their way of honoring the birds they associated with good rain. On October 30th, 1942, the Avro Anson Mark I L7056 took off from Patricia Bay in British Columbia as part of a routine exercise. On board were four crewmen, pilot Sergeant Robert Ernest Luckett, navigator pilot officer Charles George Fox, navigator pilot officer Anthony Lawrence, and wireless operator Sergeant William Baird. All of the men, except for Sergeant Baird, were from the Royal Air Force, with Baird being the only Canadian Air Force member on board. By all accounts, the flight started out routine for the men. They took off and left Patricia Bay in what they expected to be a routine exercise. Hours passed and all four men still hadn't returned to the base, sensing something was wrong. The Canadian Air Force assembled a search team and flew out in search of their men. Despite clocking in hundreds of miles, they found no sign of the men. It was as if the four of them had just vanished into thin air. There was no sign of wreckage and there had been no radio communication to suggest that they'd gotten into trouble. The official search effort was abandoned on November 3, 1942, but those who had worked alongside the four men never forgot about them and hoped that one day they would meet again. In 2013, three forestry engineers working in a wooded area on Vancouver Island came across the Avro Anson Mark I L7506 and called in the Casualty Identification Program and the Canadian Air Force. From here, the Air Force and CIP searched the area and confirmed that the plane did in fact belong to the four missing airmen. In May of 2014, the British Columbia coroner, along with a team of others, exhumed the remains of the men and sent them back to the coroner's office for identification. In mid-2014, the Canadian authorities announced that the decades-long mystery of Flight L7056 had finally been solved. They have not released the cause of the crash and it's unknown whether they were able to determine this. All of their personal belongings were recovered from the site and were handed back to the families, and the four fallen men were given a burial with full military honors at the Royal Oak Burial Park in Victoria, British Columbia. For Peter and Chris, the sons of Charles Fox, the discovery was bittersweet. They had waited 71 years to find out what had happened to their father, and now they had finally gotten closure. When a filmmaker first heard of the weird history story of the Wojtek bear, they thought it was just a fantasy. It definitely seemed like the stuff of an urban legend, but the story of a bear that helped Polish soldiers during the Second World War was a true story. Wojtek was a Syrian brown bear adopted by Polish soldiers on their way from a prisoner of war camp to North Africa. They'd been imprisoned after the joint German-Soviet invasion of their homeland. But now that the USSR had joined the war on the side of the Allies, they were being allowed to fight in one of the British overseas territories. When they found the bear cub in Iran, he was underfed and looked tired. It was something they could relate to. They bought the bear from a boy who had previously adopted him and took him with them on their journey to Iraq. The bear was given the name Wojtek, which means smiling soldier. Wojtek learned to behave like the soldiers who had adopted him who became members of the 22nd Artillery Supply Company of the Polish Two Corps. He would salute like the other soldiers, drank beer and ate cigarettes. Due to the heat, he also had a fondness of the shower block and even learned to turn on the shower by himself. It caused a problem due to the water rationing that was taking place, but his love for water would actually come in useful. On one occasion, a local opponent to British rule had snuck into the camp to cause trouble. He was hiding in the shower tent when Wojtek came in to cool himself off. 
The intruder was so scared that he alerted the troops to his presence. When the company was shipped to Italy to fight at Monte Cassino, Wojtek was enlisted as a soldier and given the rank of private so that he would be allowed to join his adopted family. It was at the Battle of Monte Cassino that the most famous true history story of Wojtek's life took place. He would carry empty ammunition crates and used shells. The Battle of Monte Cassino was a horrific battle in which many soldiers lost their lives, but ultimately the Allied forces were able to take the mountain fortress. After the battle, the company Wojtek was officially a part of changed their insignia to that of a bear holding a shell. Wojtek survived the war and went with a number of other Polish soldiers and his troop to Scotland. At first, he lived on a farm, but he was eventually moved to the Edinburgh Zoo, where he would allegedly wave if he heard Polish speech in the crowd. Despite never visiting Poland, he became a symbol for the country. To honor this weird true history story, a statue of the bear was unveiled in Edinburgh, with the bronze statue resting on a platform of Polish granite. The 1902 Cirque du Nord is both one of the strangest sporting events in history, but also promoting one of the strangest government policies. About 10 years after the birth of the modern car, it was still being debated what would be the most common fuel. The internal combustion engine had been designed with gasoline in mind, but it was speculated that it could be adapted for alternative fuels. Politicians in France were keen to see this happen. France had few natural oil reserves, and there was a desire for a homebrewed fuel to power cars. For decades, experiments using alcohol as a fuel source had been conducted, but it didn't compare to what gasoline-powered cars were able to achieve. French politicians were keen to change that. The Minister for Agriculture, Jean Dupuy, was the biggest proponent of this. In 1901, he launched a competition for the best alcohol-fueled cars and appliances. The following year, there was an exhibition of alcohol-powered machinery, which would travel across the world and even to America. But he still had a tough time convincing the public that this was the way to go. In 1902, he organized an event which he believed would prove once and for all that alcohol was a viable alternative to gasoline. The Cirque du Nord was a two-day racing event that attracted more than 60 competitors. Over the course of two stages, drivers would race from city to city, and the cars they drove had to be powered by 100% alcohol. There had been previous races using the alternative fuel in the past. In 1899, a number of cars had lined up for such a race. Only one completed it, and at a painfully slow rate. Another race, a few years later, allowed drivers to mix alcohol and gasoline. It was clear to all that the more petrol was in the mixture, the faster the cars went. This time, Depoy wanted to prove that the cars using alternative fuel could go just as fast. At the end of the event, the winner averaged 44.8 miles per hour, which was a reasonable speed at the time. Depoy claimed this made his experiment a success. The problem was, the race took place mostly through open countryside, where there were no spectators or officials. As soon as drivers were out of sight, they would stop and mix traditional fuel into their engines. Unsurprisingly, the race didn't do too much to encourage the use of alternative fuel, and it would become an obscure, strange but true story. The Russian Sleep Experiment is a fictional creepypasta story in which a group of scientists run an experiment on a group of prisoners of war who were given a gas that made them unable to sleep. The story is completely fictional, but the actions of one Russian during the First World War led to a story even stranger than fiction. Paul Kern was a Hungarian soldier during the war. During a battle in a village that was at the time a part of Austria, Paul suffered a bullet wound to the head. Under almost any other circumstances, it would have been fatal. When he was taken to a hospital, it was likely nobody expected him to live. Despite the seriousness of the injury, Paul did live. Not only that, but he didn't suffer any damage to his hearing, sight, or other senses. Waking up in the hospital, it seemed like he would make a full recovery, but as time went on, he made a very strange discovery. He couldn't sleep. No matter what he tried, he could not fall asleep. Not only that, but he no longer felt the need to sleep. 
Even though he would stay awake all night, he didn't feel tired or fatigued in any way. Paul would never sleep again. He became a medical marvel and was studied around the world by doctors who tried to understand what had happened. The obvious explanation would be that he was faking it, but doctors would observe him for weeks at a time, and at no point did he fall asleep. He would rest his eyes for an hour a day, but this was to rest his optic nerves and he remained awake during that time. No explanation was ever found. Scientists still don't properly understand why we need to sleep. It's believed to mostly be so our brain can restore itself. Paul did suffer damage to his brain during the attack, and it's possible the part of the brain that needed restoring was the part that Paul was now missing. Another theory was that Paul had microsleeps that even he didn't realize he had. He would pass away after 40 years, having never slept again and leaving behind an unexplained historical mystery. It's impossible to overstate just how horrifying the Second World War was, but among the horrors were stories of humanity and people doing what they could to help others. Some of these stories seem too strange to be true. The story of Syndrome K is one such story. Syndrome K was a disease that Axis forces had never heard of before, but seemed to be overrunning a hospital in Rome. It was a Catholic hospital, so it wasn't under control of Italy's terrifying government regime. It sat on an island in the Tibet River, not far from Rome's Jewish neighborhood. It welcomed people taking refuge from the regime, including a Jewish doctor. But being on the island didn't mean safety. Even though it was under the control of the regime, there was nothing stopping German forces from coming to the hospital in search of Jewish refugees, and others trying to flee the regime. Professor Giovanni Borromeo needed to find a way to stop them. Borromeo was the head physician at the hospital. He had gone out of his way to find a hospital to work at that didn't require a membership to Mussolini's political party. He was the main reason why the hospital was open to those trying to escape persecution, and he would do everything in his power to help them, which was where Syndrome K came in. The refugees that had come seeking shelter were diagnosed with the disease. It was a highly infectious neurological condition that could lead to paralysis and even loss of life. When German officers came searching for people who had escaped a raid on the Jewish neighborhood, they weren't stopped from looking around. They were warned of the disease though. Syndrome K sounded a lot like Koch syndrome, another name for tuberculosis. Given the lethality of the disease, the officers didn't want to catch it and let the hospital be. Of course, Syndrome K didn't exist. The fictional disease may have saved the lives of many of those diagnosed with it. From the hospital, the refugees were moved to safe houses and other locations away from Axis control. Somewhere between 25 and 100 people were saved by the quick-thinking doctor and other hospital staff who were able to keep up the story until just a month before Allied forces liberated the city. The Profumo Affair sounds like something from a fictional spy novel, but this true history story was one that British newspapers eagerly covered in the early 1960s. The weird event even reached the press in early 1963. A man had fired at a flat in London where his ex-lover Christine Keeler was living. Nobody was hurt, but the man was arrested, and as the papers tried to find more information about the story, they learned more about Keeler's past. The flat belonged to a Dr. Stephen Ward, and Ward would introduce Keeler to many of his friends in high society. It was alleged this also included introducing her to people who would pay for relations, but not everybody who she got involved with paid money. Two years earlier, Dr. Ward had introduced Keeler to John Perfumo. Profumo was a politician who had been made the war minister in 1960. He was a married man, but that didn't stop him from having a whirlwind affair with Keeler. The relationship ended after a few months, though. The papers found out about the affair after digging into Keeler's past. Normally, such personal matters wouldn't be that big of a deal to the wider public, but Profumo wasn't the only man Keeler had been seeing in 1961. At the same time, Keeler had been seeing a Russian diplomat. Given the state of the Cold War at this point, there was a general air of suspicion surrounding Russian politicians, and this was no exception. 
the press learned both men had been with Keeler and speculation began. It was suggested that pillow talk may have led to secrets being passed between the British government and the Russian military. Even if Keeler herself wasn't a spy, it was speculated she may have been used by one. In reality, no such secrets had been passed between any of the lovers, and up until that point, romances had no impact on politics. But that didn't stop politicians asking questions, and Profumo ultimately lied in the House of Commons by denying relations with Keeler. The story died down for a few weeks before Keeler testified under oath that she'd had an affair with Profumo. After this, he finally admitted what had happened and resigned. Fictional versions of this story would likely have had a major military secret being passed between the lovers. But in reality, the strange but true story would have a big impact on British politics and culture, even if, in terms of the Cold War, it had had little impact. In 1861 BC, in what we now know as southern Iraq, a small city of Aizen was ruled by a king named Era Emidi, but unbeknownst to him, a strange but true historical event was about to unfold. Since the king was highly relied upon by the government, priests and scribes were employed to study the stars so that predictions could be made as to the coming fate of the city. They did this by building huge towering temples that served as observatories, allowing them to record vital information on celestial bodies. One particular event, which is not specified but believed to be an eclipse, had them particularly concerned, as they believed it to foreshadow the untimely demise of their king. They became convinced that if the king were to pass away, chaos would break out on earth as kingship was believed to be descended from heaven. And so they devised a clever scheme by which to fool the cosmos. They decided that if the king were to pass before the celestial event occurred, the ensuing chaos would be avoided since the damning prophecy would have been fulfilled. The king was temporarily stripped of his title, and a common gardener, a man known as Enlil Bani, was chosen to act as king until the event had passed. Once they deemed it to be safe, the man would be executed and the true king would be crowned once again. But while Era Emidi was in hiding from his impending doom, he choked while eating a bowl of porridge and passed away, leaving the ruling classes in a panicked state. Upon hearing of the king's fate, Enlil Bani seized his chance and declared that his kingship had been surely planned by the gods, and since the prophecy had been fulfilled, he refused to step down as the new king. He went on to fully restore the city's temples, and was considered by his followers to be a good king, according to clay tablets that were kept by priests and scribes. He would ultimately go on to serve as the king for a further 24 years. In 1956, a weird historical event occurred thanks to a bet made between two men who were drinking in a bar in New York City. A man named Tommy Fitzpatrick was known in the area as a colorful character that spent his time with equally colorful friends. He had a keen interest in flying and decided to enroll at the Teterboro School of Aeronautics, located in New Jersey. By the time that he turned 26, Tommy was working as an airplane mechanic, but he was still just an amateur pilot. On the 30th of September, 1956, he was having a few drinks with friends in a bar located in Washington Heights. Just before 3 a.m., he left the tavern and drove to the flying school, stole one of the smaller single-engine planes, and took off. He initially intended to land the plane in a park near the bar, but found it to be too dark and so he decided to land in front of the bar on St. Nicholas Avenue. The plane's owner was so impressed by his feet that he decided to not press charges and Tommy escaped with just a $100 fine. However, two years later, on the 5th of October, 1958, a man from Connecticut disputed the story and Tommy decided to prove him wrong. He drove back to the same airfield, stole a single engine, a Cessna 120, and once again landed in front of the bar where they had been drinking, this time on Amsterdam Avenue. He decided to flee the scene, but he had been seen by several witnesses and he soon turned himself in. It was discovered that he hadn't renewed his pilot's license and had been flying without lights and on this time he was in real trouble. 
He was charged with grand larceny, dangerous and reckless operation of a plane, making an unauthorized landing in city limits, the violation of Civil Aeronautics Administration regulations for flying without a license, as well as other charges. He was ultimately sentenced to six months in prison, with the judge stating, quote, Had you been properly jolted the first time, it's possible this would have not occurred a second time. Tommy would end up working as a steam fitter for 51 years and lived in Washington Township until his passing in 2009, aged 79. However, he is still remembered through an alcoholic drink called Late Night Flight that was created in his honor. Another strange historical event, once again involving a bet between two friends, played out in London in 1809. At around 5 a.m. on the 27th of November, a chimney sweep reported for duty at the house of a woman known as Mrs. Tottenham. But she promptly sent the boy away after telling him that she hadn't ordered his services. However, just as he was leaving, another sweep arrived, only to be told the same thing. But another soon arrived at her door, and soon she had sent 12 sweeps away from her door. However, things were about to get even stranger. Soon after she'd gotten rid of the unwanted sweeps, a series of carts arrived at the house with large deliveries of coal. They were soon followed by a fleet of bakers that had been asked to deliver highly decorated wedding cakes to the house. They were then followed by doctors, priests, and other professionals, all of whom had been instructed that their services were needed by Mrs. Nottingham, who was said to have been near death. Next, over a dozen pianos arrived for delivery. Then a series of shoemakers appeared, followed by fishmongers and six men carrying an organ for delivery. As soon as they had been dealt with, the governor of the Bank of England arrived, followed by the Duke of York, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and Lord Mayor of London. The street in front of Mrs. Tottenham's residence became congested with unfinished deliveries and curious onlookers until that evening when the deliveries finally stopped arriving. Unbeknownst to everyone involved, two men, Theodore Hook and Samuel Beasley, were watching the entire spectacle unfold from a house directly across the street. Hook had made a bet with Beasley that he could cause any address in London to become the most talked about within a week. He then sent thousands of letters requesting deliveries and services to Mrs. Tottenham's home, and he quickly won his bet of one guinea. A reward was offered to anyone who could name the perpetrator, but Hook quickly departed on a tour of the country and was never arrested. He eventually became one of the country's best-known novelists and passed away at his house in Fulham at the age of 53, having never been caught for his infamous hoax. On the 20th of November, 1980, a crew of oil drillers would become a part of scary history when their rig started to tilt precariously and they were forced to abandon it. The crew had been conducting exploratory drilling in Lake Penier in Louisiana when the drill suddenly seized up at a depth of 1,230 feet. Normally, it's a quick problem to fix, but on this occasion, they were unable to work it loose and they soon heard a series of strange popping noises. Almost immediately, the drill rig started to tilt towards the water, and upon realizing that something was terribly wrong, the crew released the attached barges and used them to make their way to shore, about 300 yards away. They stood helpless as they watched the rig tilt ever further, until it overturned completely and disappeared below the water, despite the fact that the lake was known to be shallow. But their horror had only started as the water suddenly began to churn, forming a whirlpool that measured about a quarter mile in diameter. The vortex continued to grow in strength, swallowing another nearby drilling platform, a barge loading dock, trees, trucks, an entire parking lot, 11 barges and 70 acres of soil from Jefferson Island. It would later come to light that the drill had penetrated a salt mine shaft directly beneath it causing the lake to drain at an incredible speed. The lake, which contained around 3.5 billion gallons of water, had emptied in just three hours. Thankfully, the miners who were still at work beneath the lake all managed to escape, despite being as deep as 1,500 feet below the surface. Due to the accident, a natural gas line in the mine ruptured and sent fire billowing into the sky, 
causing the Federal Aviation Administration to reroute all flights that were due to travel above the area. Two days later, what had once been a shallow freshwater lake had turned into a 1,300-foot deep saltwater lake. The owners of the mine were awarded $45 million in damages and left the salt mining industry forever. No responsible party was ever identified as all the evidence had disappeared down the mine and it's still considered to be the largest recorded man-made whirlpool to ever exist. In 1961, a man named Joe Simonton became a part of weird history when he reported that he had experienced a truly bizarre encounter with alien creatures. At around 11 a.m. on the 18th of April, Joe was in his house in Eagle River in Wisconsin. He was in the middle of a late breakfast when he heard something going on outside. He decided to investigate and was shocked to find that a craft that he described as brighter than chrome was hovering in the skies above him, eventually making a landing in his backyard. To his amazement, the craft opened up and he saw three extraterrestrial beings that he described as Italian looking sitting inside. The creatures were unable to talk but they handed him a metallic container with two handles and gestured that he should fill it. He returned to his house and filled it with water, and when he returned, he saw that one of the creatures was cooking on a flameless appliance. He realized that they seemed to be cooking pancakes, which they then handed him to eat. He took the food from them and they quickly got back into the craft, saluted him, and flew off in a southerly direction, never to be seen again. Joe decided to taste the pancakes and found that they were similar in taste to cardboard. As unbelievable as Joe's story sounds, it was backed up by other witnesses, some of which were his neighbors who stated that they saw the craft heading to his farm and they contacted authorities. Members of the US Air Force working on Project Blue Book investigated the incident and concluded that Joe had in fact had a close encounter with extraterrestrial beings. The pancakes were sent to the Food and Drug Administration, which found that they were made of water, buckwheat flour, and grease, though it's rumored that the wheat was of an unknown type. While being interviewed by reporters at the scene, Joe stated that the pancakes tasted awful and that it's no wonder that the creatures were so small if that was their diet. He added that when the craft departed, he was left standing in his driveway with a stack of greasy pancakes, his mouth agape, wondering what had just happened. After the incident was fully investigated by the Air Force, it was labeled as unexplained. Before the start of the Second World War, Virginia Hall had traveled to Europe in hopes of becoming a diplomat. But because of her gender, she kept being assigned to desk jobs that she found dissatisfying. These efforts were further hampered when she was involved in a hunting accident in 1933 that caused her to lose one of her legs to amputation. But the 27-year-old was far from deterred. She named her artificial leg Cuthbert and successfully applied for a position with the Special Operations Executive, Britain's Secret Service at the time. At the same time, women were forbidden from serving on the front lines, and many of her supervisors believed that Virginia would survive no more than a few days in France where she was stationed. Adding to their skepticism was the fact that she walked with a limp that made her stand out, earning her the nickname the Limping Lady. But contrary to everyone's expectations, Virginia went on to become a force to be reckoned with. She played a major role in the recruitment of resistance fighters that assisted in Allied invasions. In one incident, she was responsible for breaking 12 fellow agents out of an intern camp. In November of 1942, she learned that Allied forces were set to invade North Africa, and in retaliation, German forces moved to invade parts of France. She decided to escape and met up with a guide who traveled with her over a 7,500-foot pass in the Pyrenees Mountains, unencumbered by her disability. In 1944, after returning to France, she disguised herself as an elderly milkmaid often selling cheese to German soldiers while organizing drop zones, establishing safe houses, and supplying Allied forces with weapons, enabling them to carry out vital operations against German forces. She had become one of the German forces' most feared spies, and after the war ended, she was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross Medal for her bravery. 
And whenever she was praised for her role in winning the war, she would reply, it was just six years of my life. To this day, Earl Pitts, a former FBI agent, is considered to be one of the worst spies ever, with one law enforcement official describing his IQ as probably being as high as room temperature. But this wasn't apparent until a Russian diplomat started working for US intelligence, and he supplied the FBI with a story that would, under any other circumstances, be hard to believe. In July of 1987, the diplomat was working at the Soviet mission to the United Nations in New York when he received a strange letter. It informed the man that he was under surveillance by the FBI agents after they had erroneously decided that he was a spy. The diplomat correctly assumed that the author of the note was an FBI agent who was offering to betray the US for monetary gain. A meeting was arranged and Pitts was instructed to meet the diplomat at the New York Public Library in the same spot where he had met another Russian eight years prior. But his memory wasn't that of a skilled spy, and he ended up wandering around the public affairs section of the library for half an hour while the men he was meant to meet up with was waiting for him in the law section. Unbeknownst to Pitts, the diplomat was there in assistance to the FBI, who had by now realized that he was selling US secrets to Moscow. From 1987 to 1992, he had amassed a total of $224,000 in return for intel, but this would soon come to an end. The FBI had started an investigation into his dealings that would ultimately last 16 months with Pitts falling for virtually every trap they set against him. His wife Mary, who also worked for the FBI, had become suspicious that he might be a traitor, but despite this, he kept selling information. On one occasion, he became aware that he was being watched via a camera that had been placed in the ceiling of his office. Yet, he went as far as placing the money he earned from his nefarious deals inside the same ceiling. After receiving a visit from a man with a Russian accent, Mary decided to search his desk and she found a letter from the Russian diplomat. She confronted him after relaying her fears to the FBI, but he dismissed her concerns by saying that he was working undercover. But despite knowing that the FBI was watching him and that his wife had warned them against him, Pitts went ahead on an offer from an FBI agent posing as a Russian spy to sell further secrets for a total of $15,000. The day after he missed his meeting at the library, Pitts met up with the Russian diplomat at Washington National Airport, where he was handed $20,000, finally leading to his arrest and ending his bumbling career as a spy. Michael Bettany, an intelligence officer working for MI5 in their counter-espionage branch, was twice accused of betraying his fellow agents. But on both of these occasions, he was found to be a loyal service agent. But he was far from being a competent and trustworthy spy. On one occasion, he received a criminal conviction and final warning after he attempted to ride on a train without purchasing a ticket. He also tried to use an expired railway season ticket to ride a train, but was soon called out and after failing to declare the incident as he was required to do, he knew that he would soon lose his job, as it would certainly be discovered at his next routine security screening. In another incident where he was being pursued by police officers for being intoxicated in public, he shouted, you can't arrest me, I'm a spy. The final nail in the coffin of his career came when he transferred to the anti-terrorist branch of MI5 in December of 1982. He decided to take a large number of secret documents home with him from his office in London. He then selected a few key documents and traveled to the house of General Andy V. Gott, the head of the KGB station in London, and dropped them through the letterbox in his front door. But unbeknownst to Bettany, Colonel Oleg Gordievsky, who also worked at the KGB station, was in fact working as an MI6 agent. Gordievsky informed his co-workers at MI6, and Bettany was quickly identified and arrested. Upon his arrest, it came to light that he was getting ready to fly to Vienna, where he would have handed over more secrets to Russian operatives. He would ultimately be sentenced to 23 years in prison. It's normally the case that spy operations are well thought out and executed with pinpoint precision. But in 1942, 
It took a small Canadian town just a few minutes to foil a plot that had been set in motion by German spies. Werner von Janowski, a German operative, had been dropped off by a U-boat near the town of New Carlisle in Quebec. He was supposed to travel to Montreal by train, but stopped for directions at the Carlisle Hotel. But from the moment that he reached the front desk of the hotel, he was under suspicion. His first mistake came in the form of the currency he used to pay for his room. Hotel staff noticed that the $1 bills he handed them were oversized and had not been used since the First World War. Second, he gave his name and address as William Branton from 323 Danforth Avenue in Toronto. But he was unaware that that address was, at the time, the location of a women's wear boutique. He also spoke in a strange European accent. He stated that he had arrived by bus that morning and that he was just stopping in at the hotel to have a bath and a quick breakfast. But the first bus into New Carlisle wasn't due for another three hours. Further clues soon surfaced. He lit his cigarettes with matches that had been manufactured in Belgium, despite the fact that Belgium had been under German occupation for three years. His clothes were unmistakably a foreign cut and smelled of diesel since he had just departed from a U-boat. After he'd been given directions to the train station, the hotel's owner's son, Earl Annette Jr., contacted authorities, and as soon as Von Janowski took his seat on the train, he was confronted by an officer from the Quebec Provincial Police. He was asked to provide his identification. He immediately confessed that he was a German officer, and he spent the rest of the war in an English prison camp. Germany would only send one more spy to Canada, but as soon as he arrived, he threw his radio away and moved to Ottawa, where he spent the thousands of dollars that had been given to him by his superiors, eventually turning himself in when he ran out of money. Operation Pastorius was named after Francis Daniel Pastorius, who established the first German settlement in America. The aim of the German operation was to sabotage the American war effort, thereby demoralizing American civilians. The agents selected for the operation were either living in the U.S. or had lived there at some point. Two of the men, Ernst Berger and Herbert Haupt, were American citizens at the time, while the rest had worked in the U.S. in the past, including George Dash, Edward Curling, Richard Kieran, Heinrich Heink, Hermann Nugbauer, and Werner Thiel. They received training, were given complete backstories, and were told to only converse in English sharpening their knowledge of the language by reading American newspapers and magazines, which also kept them informed of current events. But the mission encountered difficulties from the start, with Dash, the head of the team, accidentally leaving secret documents on a train, and one of the other agents, while intoxicated, announcing to customers in a bar in Paris that he was a spy. But the two teams eventually made it to the US, where they met at a hotel in Cincinnati. But as soon as they arrived, Dash called Berger to his room and told him that he had no intention of carrying out their mission, opting to report their plans to FBI agents instead. Berger agreed and Dash contacted the FBI in New York, but he ended the call when the FBI agent he spoke to doubted his story. Not to be outdone, he decided to travel to Washington, D.C., where he encountered the FBI's offices and dumped $84,000 their entire budget, cash, into the desk of D.M. Ladd, the assistant director. Over the following two weeks, Dash revealed the locations of the seven other agents who were quickly arrested before their mission could commence. Dash's hopes of receiving clemency were, however, short-lived, as the FBI claimed that they had, in fact, uncovered the operation. All eight men were charged with various violations of war and conspiracy to commit sabotage. They were all sentenced to be executed, but Dash and Berger had their sentences commuted to 30 years and life in prison, respectively, since they turned themselves in. The other six men all lost their lives on the 8th of August, 1942. Albert Einstein is one of the most recognizable faces in the scientific world. And while his ideas and theories changed the way we think, He's also at the center of another strange historical event. Einstein worked on the theory of relativity, which has completely changed the way physics think about the world and the observable universe around us. 
Einstein traveled to different universities and educational institutions, hoping to share his knowledge, and after he passed, everyone was curious about what his brain could tell us, and whether it held the key to human intelligence. Shortly after Einstein's passing, the scientific world gathered to mourn one of the 20th century's best scientists. On April 19, 1955, Albert's family gathered at the crematorium, and at their father's request, there was no ceremony. But there was one problem. One of Albert's children, Hans, had uncovered a dark secret. His father's brain had been removed by Dr. Thomas Harvey, and as a result, his body was not intact when it was sent to the crematorium. Hans and Albert's other children were furious, but Dr. Harvey defended his decision telling Albert's family that his brain was too important not to study. After all, their father had developed the theory of relativity and was incredibly intelligent. Using his charm and wit, Dr. Harvey convinced Hans to let him keep his father's brain, even though Albert had strictly stated he did not want to be studied by scientists. Things quickly fell apart for Dr. Harvey, though after Hans informed his workplace, the Princeton Hospital, about the incident. As Dr. Harvey had taken it without the consent of Albert's family, he lost his job. The loss of his job and the scandal put a strain on his marriage, so Dr. Harvey decided to move to an undisclosed location, taking Albert Einstein's brain with him. Dr. Harvey preserved the brain in mason jars filled with hard cellulose and continued his studies in secret. No one had any idea where Dr. Harvey had gone, and for decades the location of Albert Einstein's brain remained a mystery. As the years went on, it appeared as though the bizarre mystery would never be solved. That was until one investigative reporter caught wind of the strange historical story and decided to dig into it himself. This reporter managed to track Dr. Harvey down in Kansas, where he still had small parts of the sample. In 1978, the mystery of what happened to Albert Einstein's brain was finally solved in part. Unfortunately, much of Albert's brain has never been recovered, and it's believed that parts of it have either been buried in the Midwest US or were given away to friends of Dr. Harvey. The parts that were recovered were immediately sent for testing, and the tests revealed that Albert Einstein's brain was pretty much the same as everyone else's although solid conclusions could not be drawn due to the small samples. These samples have now been safely stored away at the Penn Medicine Princeton Medical Center in New Jersey. Security around these samples is so tight that not even the best neurological researchers are allowed to get their hands on them. The mystery of Albert Einstein's brain will go down in history as one of the most obscure and bizarre cases to ever occur. If you've ever taken a first aid course or class, you'll likely recognize this face. This unknown woman is responsible for saving the lives of millions. But unfortunately, her life ended in tragedy. The story behind the CPR dummy is bizarre and unnerving, and makes for a very strange historical mystery that has never been solved. In the 19th century, a young woman was pulled from the Seine River in Paris and immediately she struck the mortician who prepared her for the funeral home. The mortician was so enamored by her beauty that he decided to preserve it forever. He later wrote saying, quote, her beauty was breathtaking and showed few signs of distress, so bewitching that I knew beauty as such must be preserved. He created a mask of the unidentified woman's face, showing her calm expression, even in light of what had happened to her. Her photograph was circulated throughout Paris, but nobody came forward to claim her, leaving her with the name The Unknown Woman of the Seine. Once the mask had been created, the mortician sold copies of it, not just in Paris, but around the world. Her mask became a morbid collectible for those interested in the macabre and strange. But even with her face being so widely circulated, nobody knew who she was. The strangeness of the mask and the story behind it overshadowed the fact that she remained unidentified. Then in the 1950s, her face would once again be put on display for the world to see. The first CPR dummy was created in the 1950s by Archer Gordon, a member of the American Heart Association's CPR committee 
and a Norwegian toy maker. Archer knew that a dummy would help teach students proper CPR, and all he needed was a human face to add to the doll. Archer had seen the mask of the unknown woman of the Seine at a family member's house, and decided that she would be perfect. By the 1960s, the dummies had been mass-produced, and once again, the unknown woman's face was being seen by millions across the world. Nowadays, she's often called Resussi Annie, and her strange story continues to live on. Unfortunately, the story of the unknown woman is a historical mystery that may never be solved due to the amount of time that has passed. Nevertheless, while we don't know her name, millions of us instantly recognize her face, and she is the owner of the most kissed lips in the world. While it's common knowledge that many high-ranking German officials fled to South America after World War II, what many people don't know is that something similar happened after the American Civil War in 1865. History books teach us that the Confederacy was defeated and that the North won, unifying the states once more. However, there was a small offshoot of Confederate troops that fled to South America, and their presence is still felt to this day. Following the end of the war, the Confederate troops knew that it was over for them. The South had lost and their ideas and hopes had been quashed. But then the Emperor of Brazil, Dom Pedro II, threw them a lifeline. Pedro had been a supporter of the Confederacy and offered those from the South a chance to move to Brazil to continue their lives and carry on fighting for what they believed in. Pedro paid for those who were willing to make the move and in total, between 8,000 and 10,000 Confederate troops and their families moved to the Sao Paulo region of Brazil. Pedro had another motive, aside from being a supporter of the Confederacy. Brazil was struggling compared to the US and its neighbors and Pedro thought that new Americans, who were dubbed Confederados, would help bring prosperity to Brazil and also help them agriculturally. Pedro was obsessed with making Brazil more white and European, and the introduction of white Americans was perfect for his plan. Unfortunately, the climate in Brazil proved to be too hot and arid for those who were accustomed to the swampy waters of the south. Many of the confederados who moved to Brazil quickly fled back to the US after realizing that their ideas and beliefs would not flourish in Brazil as promised. A few hundred confederados stayed behind and created the settlement of Americana, where everyone spoke with a Southern American accent, and they continued to bring Southern influence to the area. In modern times, the Brazilian population has mixed with the confederados, but every year there's a festival celebrating their ancestry. According to BBC, quote, they all take part in stereotypical Southern things like square dances, eating fried chicken and biscuits and listening to George Strait. There's a lot of Confederate flags everywhere. The Confederados are rarely mentioned in history books, and their annual festivals fly under the radar of the mainstream. This small slice of history is undoubtedly one of the strangest you will ever come across. In July of 1518, Frau Trafia took to dancing in the streets of Strasbourg. At first, people enjoyed her dancing, clapping and encouraging her. However, when hours had passed and Trafia was still dancing, they became gravely concerned. What happened next would become one of the weirdest plagues in human history. Trafia continued dancing through the night and well into the morning. Hours quickly turned into days and people gathered around her, bewildered that she was still dancing. But something was alluring about her dancing and people quickly began to join in. Once they started, they found themselves unable to stop dancing into the wee hours of the night. After a week, Trafia's dancing circle had amassed 34 people, and nobody could figure out what was going on. Bizarrely, by the end of July, over 400 people had joined in, and it was clear that the dancing plague was spreading quickly. Doctors and others in Strasbourg were keen to put an end to the mysterious plague. But no matter how hard they tried, people kept dancing, and even more people joined in. The officials even built a stage for the dancers, hoping that they would soon grow tired of it, but it had the opposite effect. Officials were now getting desperate and were terrified that the strange dancing plague would spread and affect the entire town. 
As July morphed into August, the dancing circles continued, but by now people were beginning to suffer the effects. Local doctors believed that those affected were suffering from hot blood, but provided no cure for the nonstop dancing. Many of those affected began to slowly pass away due to exhaustion, and some people even had heart attacks due to the massive strain the dancing had put on their bodies. The people of Strasbourg continued to try and live their lives, watching as the dancing circles got smaller and smaller with each day that had passed. By September of 1518, the town officials had formulated a plan. The few dancers that were left were taken to a mountain to pray the plague away. Some attributed the mysterious plague to a Catholic saint who said to be able to curse people and make them dance. Others believed that the dancing plague is a simple case of mass hysteria that ripped through the town. In 1518, Strasbourg was in the grips of a famine which placed a large amount of stress on the townsfolk, leading to mass hysteria. Likely, we will never know the true cause of this mysterious plague. The Anglo-Zanzibar War of 1896 holds the record for being the strongest and shortest war in history, lasting a mere 38 minutes. This war is often skipped over in history books, which instead discuss World War I and World War II. On August 25th, 1896, Sultan Hamad bin Thuwaini of Zanzibar passed away unexpectedly, leaving a power vacuum. The British had already signed a treaty with Germany, giving them access to Zanzibar, and when the news of the Sultan's passing hit British diplomats in the country, they were ready to find a new leader. As the British were getting ready to sort out the royal affairs, they discovered that the Sultan's nephew, Khalid bin Bargash, had already assumed the position of Sultan. This new sultan had not been approved or appointed by the British, and they set about removing him from power. But Khalid wasn't going down without a fight, and began getting his troops together to defend his position. Troops stood at the palace waiting to defend their new leader, while the British set about negotiating with Khalid. When negotiations could not be agreed upon by August 26th, the British began attacking the palace under the direct orders of the foreign office. At 9.02 a.m., the British began their fight, moving toward the palace and using any means necessary. By 9.40 a.m., just 30 minutes later, Khalid had pulled down his flag and had surrendered. In just 38 minutes, over 500 people had been injured, and the British were now able to choose a new leader. 38 minutes changed Khalid's life forever in what has turned out to be one of the weirdest historical events. Shortly after losing, he fled to the nearest German consulate and was smuggled into Tanzania. Khalid would be captured by the British many years later and ended up being exiled for his crimes. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts and I'll catch you guys in the next video.